Happy cities. How can urban design boost our well-being? Hi, my name is Marcin Wojciech Żebrowski and welcome to the newest episode of Herbcast, my podcast about urbanism, architecture, cities and many more. Urban design significantly impacts our well-being and the quality of life. And this is something that was understood by Happy Cities, which leads the way in creating healthier, happier and more inclusive communities around the world. Happy Cities is a consultancy that uses the science of well-being to create healthier, happier and more inclusive communities. It was created many years ago by an award-winning journalist, Charles Montgomery, who, after a big success of the book, created the consultancy Happy Cities to help cities around the world. And today I'm happy to talk to Tristian Cleveland, who is an urban planner and researcher with Happy Cities and also a PhD candidate at the Dalhousie University's Healthy Populations Institute, focusing on how to redesign suburbs to support an active, healthy lifestyle. Tristian shares Happy Cities' innovative urban design solutions that improve people's well-being in numerous cities, and we will discuss their evidence-based research that incorporates the community's perspective. This conversation is possible thanks to Katarzyna Niemier, who is a partner of the Canadian Embassy in their She Leads Here project, which allows her to participate in meetings with politicians from Canada and Poland regarding urban policies, just transition and the implementation of eco-climate concepts in Polish cities. Katarzyna asked me to be a media partner, an overall partner of her workshop about happy cities and its role in transforming our cities. And I'm very happy to share this talk with Tristian as a part of this partnership. If you would like to get to know about her project and her workshop, please free to check the links in that episode's description. And now let's start with talking about the happy cities. Tristan, I'm so happy that you are here in, in Herbcast. Welcome. I'm glad, happy to be here. Most of my talks are based in Europe with uh, people from Poland, for example, or Denmark. To get some context, I would love to ask you for a very short introduction and also and the background behind the Happy Cities, which I hope is already known to some of the listeners. Yeah, so our company was started by Charles Montgomery, who was originally a journalist. But, you know, there's a there's a strong heritage of that <laughs> in urban planning. Jane Jacobs, of course, was also a journalist. Of and uh, yeah, Charles had written a number of books before, um, but he wrote this book about the importance of urban design for supporting human happiness. Basically, this idea that, of course, our habitat is going to matter for whether we lead good lives. And for the last century, we've been doing a pretty poor job of building good habitat for humans. And so an enormous proportion of humanity, sadly, especially in North America, the United States and Canada, it's atrocious. So many people are stuck spending two hours a day in traffic, the complete uncertainty of whether they'll be able to get to work on time, coming home late to their children, to their family, creating tensions in the household, uh, not seeing friends very often because they live so far from each other, having very little time for exercise because their life has to be so built around driving at all times for all things. The car was supposed to be a technology for freeing us and instead has entrapped so many people in this, this kind of prison of traffic. So he wrote this book about how we can how we can do this better, how we can design these cities that, that people enjoy life. They feel free. They can easily get things. They see their friends without having to think about it. You know, good access to green space, all this stuff we'll be talking about. And after he finished it, people started contacting him and saying, OK, great. So let's do it. How do we do this? So he realized, OK, I actually have to start a consultancy. Mm. So he started this company now, you know, employing a lot of urban planners and architects. And um, we help developers and countries and local governments around the world implement 
strategies for supporting well-being, but also helping them design specific communities to really translate the research on how to support well-being into concrete mm. practice. And I mean literal concrete. <laughs> <laughs> Would it be fair to say that The Happy Cities was created by a book? Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, the book was Happy City, and it's the reason we exist. It's still very much our inspiration, but it's also our uh, our ethos. That book was a you know an exercise of translating the best research into an easily accessible guide on how we can do things better. And that's still what we're doing. You know, we're the Happy City. It's in our DNA. We're all about really research based best practices translating those into the day-to-day -day design of communities and also creating strategies and report and assessment tools and all of that to help average people and counselors and local governments understand what they need to do to support happiness and, and make it happen. I've read Child's book myself many years ago because it was a very successful one in Poland, yeah. actually. It was translated into Polish and it was called Miasto Szczęśliwe, <laughs> <laughs> which is basically happy, happy city. And I think that the success was built on, or how I see it, it was that basically many people read it and a lot of them were from, let's say, this outside, this urban design or city planning field. And I think that it helped many to understand what actually creates a happy city, the one that prioritizes well-being. So I need to say that this is also such a, a great feeling for me to, to be able to talk about the book now, a couple of years after. And I was just wondering if we discussed about designing cities and urban design, would you team up with some architects to help you introduce the urban design principles or would you just do it yourself? Oh, uh, you know, we have architects on staff mm -hmm. and we often work with architects. Absolutely. Yeah. Because they, uh, they play this crucial, crucial role in supporting well-being. I just published a piece recently, The Responsibility of the Building to the Street in Plan Edison, where I really underlined the importance of the exterior building design. Often people think about the aesthetics, the, the visual look of buildings to be not that important for the practical things in life, for jobs and, and all of that. But I point out that actually it's crucial. Mm. You have to create these streets that are comfortable, where people want to spend time, which requires attractive buildings. You know, if you got ugly blank walls, no one's ever going to want to spend time on that street, no matter how, you know, whether you put murals on it or whatever. Basically, everything we want to accomplish in cities for, especially for supporting well-being, depends on creating streets where people want to be. If you want to open businesses, if you want to create festivals, if you want to make streets safer by having more people there, more eyes on the street, if you want to increase transit ridership, so many things, grow your local economy, attract talent from other cities to your city, all these things require building those human-friendly streets. So yeah, architects play an absolutely central role. Would you say that aesthetics is something that we can measure or is it something that is rather a very subjective way of looking at buildings? Certain base requirements of aesthetics absolutely can be measured, mm. but as a whole, it cannot be. So let me clarify. So we know that you need a certain amount of visual diversity in a scene, and there's a number of ways to measure that. It's basically like when you walk through a forest, there's a certain amount of, of detail, the branches, the twigs, the leaves, that is feeding your eyes and making you feel comfortable. And there's a big difference between that and a blank wall, and it's measurable. There's a number of interesting mathematical tools for, for measuring that. There's also, you know, biophilia. So humans are attracted to greenery. You need a certain amount of trees and bushes, and that's, that's not hard to measure. It's very clear if a street is too full of garbage or that kind of thing, that's easy to measure. Or if um, it is especially easy to measure if a street is, is doing things terribly wrong, you know, if, they, if there are, in fact, just blank walls or a wall that is you know, 40 stories high with no details mitigating that, that size, and that's going to make people feel like ants. So avoiding the worst outcomes can often be measured, but achieving excellence cannot be measured. Mm. And that is because the thing that we are designing for are human beings. What decides whether we enjoy a street is the human brain. Mm. And if we wanted to create a computer that could, or an algorithm that could fully predict whether a human brain will be attracted to a street, that algorithm would have to be as complex as the human brain itself. I hope that was pretty clear for listeners. That The point is, the only tool and the best tool we have for measuring whether humans will be attracted to a street is the human brain itself. So we must not 
forget to use our brains. We can use the math, et cetera, to establish the minimum requirements. But to create excellence, we have to trust in our own ability to look at a street and recognize whether it will be one that will attract people or whether it's dehumanizing and will push people away. I think it's a very interesting thread and I would love to develop it even more and uh, go a bit deeper because when we talk about the aesthetics and about the visual perception of a street or a city in a bigger context, what about the sound? Because I feel mm. that it's often that sound is more disturbing than attractive. Do you also yeah. take into consideration sound in your work? That is an issue that often affects people subconsciously. When you're walking down the street trying to listen to a podcast, you suddenly realize how loud those trucks are oh, going yes. by because when they go by, oh, you yes. suddenly can't hear anymore. But if you didn't have it in, you might not have noticed how loud that was. Noise affects people's stress level, so that's very easily measured. And it also impacts how social people are, so whether people are willing to talk to each other on the street, on a, a nice, pleasant street Say in, in Venice, where there's no cars and very little noise, it's, it's a very, very attractive environment for stopping, lingering, and, and chatting with friends. When you're having to yell over the background din of trucks and, and buses, it becomes very difficult. So electrifying our transit fleets is going to make a big impact on, on improving our downtowns. Trolleys already do help out a lot, in, like in a lot of European cities, much less so in, in North America. It's also very important to have soft surfaces on your streets. So lots of trees, lots of wooden benches, lots of umbrellas and I mean, terraces, et cetera, et cetera. All this stuff helps absorb sound. When you have just sheer concrete sidewalk and walls, um, that just creates a kind of echo chamber that really creates an unpleasant environment. Mm. We often miss this, but you know, when you walk into an environment with lots of terraces and umbrellas, et cetera, it's visually much, much more enticing. Hmm. We can often miss that actually part of the reason why we're more comfortable there is because the, the sound environment is also much more comfortable. Hmm. But those two things work together. They're complementary. Before we go full on with the solutions that we could implement in our cities and... I'm always full on with solutions. <laughs> it's hard to get me off. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that, but uh, I would like to complain a bit more. Actually, I would just like to talk about some challenges and, and obstacles that we have in our cities. And uh, the reason for that is, is that I find many cities, it can be in Poland, it can be also in, in other cities in Europe that I know, it is often that we don't feel safe or we, we feel overwhelmed or as we just discussed, we, we hear a lot of sounds, we have a lot of visual incentives, a lot of advertisements in the public space, especially in Polish cities, unfortunately. And what I mean is that we are getting more and more tired. There's some research saying that actually people are getting tired of being in cities and pandemic also showed that people who could try to move out of the, of the city center, maybe to, to the suburbs or to the outskirts, to just uh, relax a bit. So here I would like to just develop this thought of, of some obstacles and challenges that we have nowadays in the city. It can be the loud tracks, it can be the unpleasant environment because of the construction site. How do you identify those challenges and what are the biggest challenges that you've met during your work as Happy Cities? Well, I guess um, one thing I'd like to underline is that it's very important to think about urban design in terms of trade-offs Mm. And different sets of people make different trade-offs. Mm. So it's very desirable to have really, really, really high activity, dense urban areas with it just a ton of street life and, you know, hundreds of vendors on the street all hawking their wares and that kind of excitement and, and lots going on. And there's a, a certain proportion of society. Most people will at least want to visit that kind of environment periodically. Mm. And some people want to live in that. They just want yeah. that all the time. Many other people prefer, you know, a quieter lifestyle and cities should offer that full range. We believe that the majority of people and the research suggests that the majority of people don't want to have to give up all of the amenities, however, of a city to have that quieter lifestyle. Mm -hmm. We should be creating suburban communities that have uh, local cafes and shops, a place where they can get together with their neighbors, high quality 
local parks. There's places in Poland that actually do this quite well. Hmm. Um, Good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> Still, they want access to transit. And um, we can achieve that by keeping a really tight block structure making sure that streets are narrow so cars drive slowly, so people still feel comfortable walking outside, having local main streets that double up with transit so that transit and local businesses are reinforcing each other's success, and having that that kind of sweet spot of population that can support local businesses, having a bit more density near those businesses too. Having that sweet spot where you have those businesses without having so much that it becomes a, a, a noisy downtown-like mm-hmm. environment. I really believe we need to be offering much more of that because there's really, there's not that many people who would actually prefer to have no amenities near home, (laughs) you know? So we really need to better learn to create quiet, family-friendly, safe environments that also that also offer a certain amount of uh, local amenities and vibrancy. I feel it might be a bit contradictory to density. You've meant creating those suburban communities. But when I at least read about very well-designed cities, the density is often playing a big role or there are many advocates of density. Is it possible to aim for this diverse city with outskirts or suburbs being a bit calmer, but still having density playing a role? I mean, here, like a high density. Yeah, so absolutely. But um, let's not say high density. Let's say medium density. Let's say compact, but not not downtown, you know? We mean here, of course, the, the building density, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, residential yeah. density. Yeah, yeah. So let's say around 50 people per hectare mm. is a pretty good suburban number that supports a very high level of transit and local shops. And you can achieve that with, you know, you don't have to have everyone living in apartments to achieve that by a long shot. You know, you can have a few apartments near transit, maybe near the center. And we're talking three or four stories, some townhouses, and then further away from your transit and your main street, you can have your duplexes and single family homes and still support all of that lifestyle and access to amenities that that we were discussing. You can really have it all with that approach. And those lower density levels also allow for building designs that that support other elements of well-being that, that we find in the research. So being able to directly access the street from your unit leads to higher levels of walking, leads to greater chance that you might know your neighbors. It's especially important if you're going to have a family because people are much more likely to have their children play in a yard or a green space if they can directly access it from their unit Mm. rather than having to come down an elevator. Yeah. And so in general, the, the more that we can build these sustainable, healthy cities while keeping our urban form in like a few stories is is great. And then in other contexts, we really want to maximize density and you can build these towers and there's a way to mitigate mitigate some of those mm-hmm. problems, having more amenity spaces in those towers or balancing the, the costs of living in a tower or a smaller unit by having more access to amenities, mm-hmm. more access to jobs, better public spaces that offer more things to do and better transit, etc. So we should really be maximizing the benefits to well-being of both those lower to medium density forms and the high density forms. And I, I really do think that the, the best cities are those that combine both approaches because not all humans want the same thing. And the goal is to provide a, a range of housing types and a range of communities that match the range of human preferences. Let's now shift a bit more towards the physical examples and uh, visible examples, basically. Could you share a project, a case study from your work, from the work of Happy Cities, that was something that you remember, that was an, an important project for you, something that that shifts your way of thinking and you you find it just a successful thing? So one project, and I'm being slightly premature in discussing this since it hasn't actually been approved by council yet, <laughs> but we have a 90-unit suburban development that we designed in um, Halifax, Nova Scotia. It was very exciting to work on because it supports you know, many of these best practices I was just discussing. It has these smaller scale, four-story apartment buildings, stacked townhouses. So that's like townhouses on top of each other, also four stories, and uh, a mix of townhouses and duplexes and single family further away from transit. And it's all on a high frequency transit road. And a few things that I really enjoyed about this project is that 
First of all, we incorporated a, a classic public square. So this is something that in new suburban developments almost never happens anymore, which is a green space that is surrounded on all sides by homes that really frame that green mm. space and with public seating in the center that really make it feel like a center of civic identity. Another thing we did was we were able to incorporate quite a bit of parking. If and when it gets built, you won't be able to hardly see that parking while walking through the community. That was by positioning the buildings strategically to hide that parking. And also we focused on doing a long line of parking rather than a big parking lot. Because when you only have one layer of parking deep, it's much less impactful on the visual scene than a um, you know larger flat parking lot mm. is. So our goal in designing the site, which I think should be the goal in urban planning in general, is to really focus on the experience of the pedestrian, of the human being walking through the site. What do they see? What do they experience while they're walking through? And making sure that there's no gaps in that experience, that the buildings and the streets, the whole way consistently support a truly excellent feeling. Buildings with porches along the whole way, street that is really well defined by buildings on all sides, no, no huge gaps, no underused vague space. And then you're basically moving as you go through the site from public space to public space mm. to public space that each one with a unique design none feeling superfluous no leftover poorly defined public space each one is really you know either a public square or a local family place to gather or at transit a really public plaza where we're trying to combine the energy of people getting off of and onto the bus with people visiting a local cafe and other businesses with people enjoying the view of the ocean mm. So I guess that's the last note I would say about it is that when you're working in a suburban context, it's not like a downtown where you can rely on there being street life, where there's enough people living and working there that there will probably be some people there enlivening the street unless you absolutely ruin it with blank walls. In a suburban context, you really need to maximize the impact of your businesses, public space and transit by combining them so that you get the most possible street life that you can from a very limited amount of street life. Mm. So we're really hoping to activate this plaza by transit looking at the ocean, by piling on those different activities on top of each other so we can create this kind of a vibrant place where neighbors will bump into each other, where uh, people feel like where it's happening, but where it's still you know, quiet and pleasant enough that you can enjoy a coffee mm. and enjoy the view of the ocean. And uh, how big is the, the project to just have some sense of scale? Yeah, it's just 90 units. Yeah, five acres. I'm asking because I'm just wondering how much time does it take to develop such a project from the sketching paper and early analysis to basically the completion. And just to give you some context, after graduating, it, it really maybe not shocked me, but surprised me a bit how, how much time it takes to develop an urban design project, a master plan. It takes a lot of years. It might take 20, 30, 40 years. And I always repeat that once I have a chance to emphasize how long and complex process it is. Do you have any numbers? A private development like this takes much less time than an urban design district led by government would. So for you know, we're taking a, a site that has currently has a single house on it and just developing it like a blank slate. And most of the most successful examples of of suburban redesigns happen that way where one developer can just make it all happen at once. So the design phase for this only took um, a few months, maybe maybe six months, including public consultation, two rounds of yeah. it. So it's it's really not that bad, you know. Then the regulatory approvals takes much longer. That that would be the the bigger the bigger step. And unfortunately, in Canada and in most places, if you do design a development that really aims to do things right and support the city's goal for sustainability and walkability and health and social connection and all of this. It takes just as long as if you actually it takes longer usually than if you just proposed single family homes that achieves absolutely no goal for human well-being beyond just providing houses. And that's that's really a shame. I think that mm. uh, well-designed projects should be rewarded by a faster design review process. In terms of redesigning urban districts, that's actually a focus of my research. I'm wrapping up my PhD right now. 
And my focus is on how do you take these very, very car-oriented suburban areas and transform them into walkable areas, especially when you don't have a blank slate site, but you have you know hundreds of landowners and you have to convince them all to enough of them to reinvest, to transform the environment. Have you found an answer yet? I found many answers. Yeah. Yeah. But it, that does take many decades and there's not, I'm unaware of a single successful example that has completely transformed a community to become walkable in these conditions. I've only found partial success, mm. but we'll see maybe in the coming decades that we will actually start to see some of these communities just you know, hit a transition point where there's just so much more investment in pedestrian-oriented walkable buildings that they do completely flip. If your listeners want a concrete suggestion for how to make this work, I'm going to just give two things. Definitely. Because there's a ton, <laughs> but here's two very important things. Number one is the goal is to create a, a critical mass of people, like I was saying with, with the street life and that development we are building. You're moving from an environment where every building is aimed at the car and driving is the only viable mode because every building is aimed at the car. It's a mm. self-reinforcing logic that's very hard to get out of. And you're trying to convince developers to build buildings that don't have a parking lot on the sidewalk mm. and instead have, have businesses that aim directly at the sidewalk while sidewalks are empty and parking lots are full. It's very hard to convince them. Also, these mixed-use pedestrian-friendly buildings cost a lot more to build than, say, like a, a Walmart warehouse-style mm. big box store or, or even single-use apartment buildings. It costs a lot more. So you need to convince them that this is going to be a higher-value environment in the future. So the way to create that transition is to focus on one specific area inside the larger area where you can create that critical mass of people walking. So in, at least in that one place, developers can have confidence that they can build a pedestrian-oriented, mixed-use, high-quality building, and uh, people will rent or buy the units, and, and there will be street life. So government needs to intervene, mm -hmm. absolutely, because the incentives are completely arrayed against transformation unless government intervenes. So Critically, you can create high-quality transit as a first step. Lots of governments do that, but then fail to do anything else and nothing happens. Then you can block the view of parking lots through placemaking, through putting up greenery or kiosks or what have you. If you're planning to build a new library or a new city hall or a new recreation center or a new school, locate those in a very, very finite area and directly on one city corner or one block so that you can get that critical mass of people walking there and start to block the view of the car dominant environment. Once you have that, that nucleus of a place that has a critical mass of, of humans in a pleasant environment, then you can start to build it outwards and you've overcome the, the hardest part. The other piece of advice is to fire all of your transportation staff and hire new <laughs> ones because you simply cannot achieve these goals if you have a bunch of, you know, six lane highways running through the center of your site. And that remains, you know, a huge problem. It's, it's politically very difficult because if you're redesigning a suburb, most people drive there and they're saying, hey, you know, don't take away my road. I use that to get to work. So if you're going to bother to try to redesign an area, politicians need to make it very clear that in this one place, streets are going to be prioritizing people. You're going to be driving slowly through here. We'll still try to get traffic through, but it's going to be slow and steady, not high speed. We're going to move them through by having many streets, not by having wide streets. Mm -hmm. That's critical. And um, if and traffic needs to be slow and safe and prioritize pedestrians. And it's a totally different design philosophy from car oriented suburbs. And you simply can't do it. If your experts are people who have spent their entire career building suburban arterials, they have no idea how to do this. And they're going to feel like they have made huge, huge favors for you by reducing an eight lane road to a seven lane road, right? Well, that's not enough. So, you just have to hire a different team of people with different assumptions and use different standards that are actually aimed at what you're trying to build. You can't use motorcycle standards to build an airplane. You cannot use car-oriented suburban standards to build a walkable community. So just have to be 100% clear. You need different experts. You need different standards. Cultivation methodology. This is something that I would love to discuss in this talk as well. I really like this uh, analogy and it would be great to develop that. So 
could you explain the the cultivation methodology and how can we how can it help basically to transform those car dependent places into more walkable ones? We developed this this idea of cultivation in response to this problem that um, every single community that's trying to build walkable places is is like starting from scratch. Mm. You know, they're they're doing these like really really long engagement sessions trying to identify uh, goals and and reinvent the wheel. You know, rediscover that yes, you need density and safe streets and and mixed use zoning and and a certain level of compact growth when we already know we need those things. And so it's a bit silly. Like if you're going to build a building, you wouldn't come to people and say, what do you think about a foundation? Don't you think a foundation would be great and get their buy-in on building a foundation? No, buildings need foundations. (laughs) (laughs) So what we're pointing out is that if we know that certain things are required, we should make those default and just clarify that those are needed to the public and then consult the public more on the details of how to implement design rather than pretending to not know. Professionals should never be approaching consultation pretending to not know the research and the requirements. That's, uh, that's malpractice. So we get this word cultivation from this. If you imagine a apple farmer, apple farmers all know they need to provide manure, soil, nutrients, water, and sunlight to grow their apple trees. And providing those requirements consistently does not mean that every apple tree is the same. Actually, if you failed to provide those requirements, then the apple trees would be the same. They'd all be dead. Um, By providing the requirements, you support trees growing into their full complex variety and no two are the same. With walkable communities, we know all of them require slow traffic, safe streets, narrow streets, narrow lanes. We know they require zoning that allows a certain amount of compact growth and mixed uses. We know we need pedestrian-friendly architecture. So this is the starting point. This is the default. We still talk to the public. You still need to talk to the public about, you know, lots of things. What would you like to see on your sidewalks? How many benches do we want? Where do or benches? Where should we have public spaces? What role should these public spaces be? But we should not be asking, do you want safe walkable streets? Mm. Do you want human-friendly architecture? Those need to be assumed up front. You know, that, that needs to be asked in terms of the question, do you want a walkable community or not? If they don't want a walkable community, well, okay, we, we can't get started. Mm. But if they do, then those are just, those are things we simply need to do. That is actually our ethical responsibility to clarify we need to provide these things or none of it's worth doing at all. Then once we implement that critical mass of those requirements, so a certain amount of small block safe streets, mixed uses, and and get that first bit of density in, then we can switch roles from confidently knowing that we need to do certain things to a humbler role of supporting the community as it grows by its own logic. So once a community is growing, we should support change by its own complex self-organizing logic, the same way that a farmer doesn't try to tell a tree where to grow its next branch or, or how to grow. We should watch communities and identify, you know, if a street is becoming really, really popular with people, maybe we need to allow more mixed uses there or we need to up the level of density allowed there. If a park is uh, very popular, we might need, we should reinvest in it to make it even more exciting and, and positive and useful to people. If transit is highly used, we should reinvest in it and so that it can become even more useful to the people using it. And if there are problems, if there's a street that people aren't crossing, or if there's a section of the main street that is is dead, we can see if we can invest incrementally to solve those problems, to make the street safer, to, to make the, the street more active. So it's more of a, a humble, responsive approach. So I guess um, if I could sum all that up, mm. the cultivation methodology basically is two parts. The first is that we need to confidently implement the requirements, like the foundations of a building or the nutrients for an apple tree. And then once we have the requirements in place and the community can start to grow, we should switch to a more humble role where we're supporting that growth by its own logic rather than trying to direct it top down. Is it something that you have already implemented in a case or it's rather more theoretical now? It's theoretical Mm. now, yeah. I very much want to. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's, it's... it's a way of thinking about the biggest problem in urban planning, which is that um, we we don't know how to deal with the fact that we both want to plan cities in a bottom-up way and a top-down way. We both want to 
consult people and empower people to shape their own community. And we know that we can't predict the future. We can't predict where businesses will succeed and where growth is going to happen. But at the same time, all of our tools are top down. You know, zoning is, is a friggin' top down tool, you know, the, deciding where we invest in transit, deciding which public spaces to invest in, et cetera, is top down. So the goal with the methodology is to try to think about that in a clear way where we're saying, okay, there are some requirements that we actually have to be quite top down with and approach as professionals. That's why we need professionals. Safe streets and human friendly architecture, these things need a certain level of expertise to create consistently. And then there's other things that we really need to approach in a, in a bottom up way. I really don't think that planners should be deciding for example, where growth should happen. And this stuff is really in the development stage. I don't think anyone does zoning very well in the Mm. world right now. But we should be taking an approach where every community allows the next, these ideas come, a lot of these ideas come from strong towns, by the way. Every community should allow the next incremental level of growth so that everywhere, if it's popular, if it's a place that's attracting people, it can thicken, it can grow, it can um, build a few more stories high but that you're not replacing single family homes of 80 story buildings, except for in, in exceptional mm-hmm. cases. And then the, the city really can organize ourselves and we can take a step back and as, as professionals try to support change while it happens without having to, you know, micromanage where the apple tree grows its next branch. Thanks for, uh, for explaining this, this very interesting uh, methodology. I basically ask about it because it, it resonated with me and I hope that it will resonate with the listeners as well. And As far as I know, there are a lot of architects, urban planners, but also policymakers listening to this podcast. That's why I would like to ask you also about some some more practical advice if it comes to creating more walkable communities and also improving their well-being through urban design and not only. If we basically start with some priorities, what should be like this first step towards improving the well-being? So what, what would be this kind of step number one? Well, first of all, in a completely car-dependent environment, um, you would start with the things I was discussing earlier to get from that car-dependent paradigm to a more walkable paradigm. But once you have a certain level of walkability, I think that the number one thing, the one thing that would really impact people's day-to-day quality of life is tactical urbanism. I don't know if that's a technical term or not, but it means um, making lots of small, low-cost investments. I don't know how much Poland has a problem with this, but in Canada, the United States, we have this huge problem where when cities want to improve quality of life, they always think about conference centers and stadiums, <laughs> hundreds of millions of dollars on stuff that the average resident might go to, you know, once a year or once a decade. I don't know. Or it sometimes never. Impact. Or sometimes never. They might, you know, support businesses during a game a few times a year or during a big conference. But, you know, the the impact on most people's lives is is really negligible. Mm. Now, imagine if you took that same $100 million, say, and you split that up in all the neighborhoods throughout a city. And in each neighborhood, communities could decide for themselves, you know, anyone who's motivated enough to to come out and, and shape decisions can decide, okay, what do we need most? What would be most impactful with this money? And look, we got a few hundred thousand dollars or a few ten thousand dollars to really do something Mm -hmm. important. So, you know, we can do community gardens, we can do recreational facilities for our parks, places for people to exercise. We can beef up this crummy little park that no one spends time in with flower boxes. We can hire a gardener that can do it properly or or provide tools for homeless people so they have something they can really contribute to the community. There's there's all these things. And the community itself are the experts on that. They're not experts on everything. They're often very poorly equipped to manage traffic, for example. There's counterintuitive things that make that difficult. But when it comes to investments in public space and sidewalks that would make their community a better place, they really do know best. Mm. And they really need to be funded properly to have that impact. Because if people can reinvest in their community and every community can do this, that means that the city as a whole has a way higher quality of life. And it was much, much better positioned to attract people to live in those communities. Mm. Especially if on local streets, we allow communities to redesign those local streets. 
And to clarify, this is not a contradiction with what I just said about traffic, because (laughs) often people want to get rid of density or widen roads to deal with traffic. But as long as you're saying, okay, we're going to allow density and we're going to um, make sure that streets stay narrow, then for local streets, you really can just let people redesign them because the goal anyway is to slow down cars. Mm. So you can uh, let them narrow intersection with garden boxes. There's really a lot of things that you can do. One way to make investments especially impactful for local communities is by doing stuff like matching grants where residents actually have to get organized to get a third of the funds or half the funds because this develops their personal commitment to making it happen and the projects that do happen are the ones that people really care about. Or in my city, Halifax, they have these participatory democracy sessions where local residents have to if they want to vote, they come physically together to look at a bunch of projects that volunteers have put together to propose and then vote in the top five that, that they think should happen. And they allocate that, that funding directly. Unfortunately, that project's like not nearly funded enough. Mm. I think that the majority of our parks budget should be allocated this way and that we should just scrap things like park master planning, I think is a totally useless exercise. Uh, we should be consistently making small improvements like this by letting the communities decide what the next mm. thing is is that they need. And a hundred million dollars spent this way compared to a stadium or something, I mean it's it's not even comparable. You are growing the economic fabric and the life fabric of the entire city, making every single community a place where people visit and go, wow, this place is alive. Like look at this street. Look at you know it's it's freshly painted. You know, there's so much going on here. That's what matters to people's life. And I think it's a bit sad that today cities struggle to make small investments that actually matter to people. And it's much easier for them to make huge investments that you know allow them to cut a ribbon. I guess the last thing I'd say there is that in Vancouver, Happy City has been directly um, involved in some of this work with a program called Pavement to Plaza, where we take some local streets, we close some of them to cars. And, um, you know, we put in benches and garden boxes and, and paint the street and other things with co-designed with the local community. And then we've, since we're a research-based company, we measure the impact on how that makes people feel when they're there, whether they are more likely to trust other people there, how much they talk to people, that kind of impact. We did similar initiatives uh, in some of the Polish cities with uh, closing the car traffic temporarily and just introducing the co-design. I think that it was like such a great learning for me. We're still at the stage where when something like that happens, it's considered exciting and new, which is great. I really want to see a future, though, where this is so normal that this is happening just in every single neighborhood, constantly across the board, every city, everywhere. Because why the heck would you not be doing it? It's such a waste of money not to invest in this way because we're failing to improve our community. So it's just silly the way we currently do things. And we have to do it in full. Uh, In in my city, often we'll, to close down streets, we require putting up, you know, six foot barriers, uh, you know, the concrete walls to stop cars from running people over when we could just slow down traffic. We, we could, instead of facilitating people do this stuff, we're putting up artificial legalistic barriers to these kinds of quick, easy, low cost redesigns. So unfortunately, over the last hundred years, cities have become more bureaucratic, more legalistic. Mm. And um, when it comes to these small incremental improvements to communities, we need to get to a place where it's um, something that we're not afraid of, something that's just standard practice and, and where, where we don't require, you know, a months long permitting process to do something that everyone should be allowed to do anyways. And. Just to close up with another learning, I would love to ask you for a book recommendation. We, of course, talk about the Happy Cities and the Happy Cities book could be one of the recommendations, but maybe you have something else as well. So uh, there's actually a great book called Tactical Urbanism that that talks about this new movement of of how to um, approach the design of cities. I've been mentioning a lot of the ideas of strong towns. I don't know if your listeners are familiar with that organization, but Its founder, um, Chuck Marone, just recently came out with a book called uh, Confessions of a Recovering Engineer. And um, that book is is absolutely fabulous. It'll really change how you think about the purpose of a street in a city. Jeff Speck's Walkable City is fantastic. It just came out with a new edition with a really big new section that I haven't got a chance to read yet. But from what I hear, it was really, really great um, path-breaking ideas in that. 
You have a whole uh, library of uh, urbanism books in your head. Of course. <laughs> I mean, I just finished a PhD on it, so I better. <laughs> so, so you are the the perfect one to ask for some book recommendation, and uh, I hope that it will be useful and helpful to all the listeners. And it was to me; I learned a lot. So, I just would like to say thank you very much, Tristan, for for joining and for sharing all this. Thank you so much. It was a really great conversation, and I hope folks enjoyed. Thanks a lot for listening to the newest conversation with Tristan. And I hope that you also got pretty inspired about how we can manage, how we can change our cities and communities and also more suburban ones into more livable, more walkable spaces. Uh, something that is rather natural to human beings, as Tristan said, that we just like, we just enjoy the calm, green spaces, which are not too noisy, which are not too car oriented which are just in this right human scale size. And I think that this could be one of the key takeaways. Also, if you are interested into getting to know something more, feel free to either reach out to me or Tristan and also check the episode's description to get some links to the books or other articles that, that we've mentioned. I would also love to thank Katarzyna for helping, in, helping me in organizing this discussion with Tristan and with Happy Cities. And you will also find more information about her project, about the design thinking workshop that she organizes in Poland, about the happy cities and well-being. So feel encouraged to check it as well in the episode's description. Thank you so much for listening and talk to you very soon.